are clearly physical activities a very important context um, for children and adolescents development. And as Nicole just showed, there are many youth development programs out there that have a physical activity component, but very few have been evaluated in terms of uh, how effective they are in promoting positive youth development, whether it be the physical assets, the psychological assets, or the social assets. And Nicole mentioned a few of them, and the first T is one I'm very pleased to share with you. We're just getting ready to launch into our fourth year of research with this program. Um, and I believe it's the only one that has longitudinal research of, of impact. Okay, so let me start with the first T, philosophy. Um, as you can see, uh, the first T actually calls itself a youth development program using golf as a context for promoting um, positive youth development as opposed to a golf program. And so that's the focus, and you can see golf is the vehicle by which life skills are taught. The external assets are represented by the coaches in the program who go through a coach training program that I'll talk a little bit more about in a moment. The life skills uh, represent the internal assets, and this is framed within a curriculum called the First T Life Skills Experience that starts with a beginning level called PAR and then proceeds to Birdie Eagle, and now they have an ACE level. And together then, the context, the external assets, and the internal assets contribute to positive youth development, which they define as development in the first T9 core values. And these core values represent many of the qualities that my colleagues have already talked about. And specifically, the nine core values include honesty, integrity, respect, responsibility, sportsmanship, courtesy, confidence, judgment, and perseverance. So clearly, Nicole, that physical activity did help my cognitive functioning this morning, remembering. <laughs> Okay, I'd like to talk a little bit more about the curriculum and the external assets. So this is a, a visual of their curriculum, and along the left-hand side, you can see that there's a number of categories of, li of life skills. Interpersonal skills, such as meeting and greeting skills and showing respect. Uh, Self-management, like managing negative emotions and coping with adversity. Goal setting and resistance skills, like resisting peer pressure to engage in risky behaviors. And as you can see, the, the kids start in this par level, and the skills build upon each other as they advance to the higher levels at Eagle. And things like meeting and greeting and showing respect are reinforced at each level, but then other skills are added, like appreciating diversity and how to help others and how to seek support from others. Now, the, the, the coaches as the external assets um, are trained in a philosophy that focuses on creating a mastery motivational climate. And what they, the way that they do this is through the four building blocks. And this is a really neat way of remembering how to create a climate. And the first one is activity-based, which focuses on doing rather than telling. So if you ever go out to sometimes some youth sport um, practices, there's a lot of talking on the part of the coach rather than getting the kids actively involved right away. So we want to focus on activity. It also means integrating physical activity with the life skills in a fun and seamless way. So it's not, let's do golf, now let's go in the classroom and learn about goal setting. It's trying to integrate the concepts together and then talking about how the life skills might be bridged to other life domains. Another building block is mastery-driven. This means defining success and competence in self-reference terms, such as learning, improvement, effort, and mastering the skills rather than the competitive outcomes. The third building block is empowering youth. And this builds upon their motto about children don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And so the empowering youth has to do with being youth-centered and relationship-focused, giving children and adolescents choices and options of their physical activity. And finally, but not least, is the building block of continuous learning, 
which focuses on a feedback framework called Good, Better, How. We want to catch kids doing things correctly and then show them, uh, show them what they can improve on and how through very effective instruction. So this gives you a little bit of a snapshot then in terms of the external assets and the internal assets. So given that the first T contains all the essential ingredients of a positive youth development program, the context, external assets, and internal assets, uh, my students and I, over the past four years, in fact, we're getting ready to start data collection this Friday in Phoenix in year four, um, set about um, to evaluate the impact of the first T life skills programs on promoting youth development. Um, the curriculum looks great, the coach training looks great, but is it having an effect? And these were our three overall purposes. What impact are they having? What is unique about the program? And importantly, how can the program improve and do an even better job than they're doing now? Um, now, as we head into year four, um, I really need to indicate, I'm going to be giving you some sound bites today of uh, methodology and results from each of our three years that have been completed, um, but it doesn't really give it justice in terms of how labor intensive and difficult this research has been. And this could not be done without um, a huge team effort on the part of my students. I've had six different students over the last four years participate in this project. Um, and four of them are in the audience today. So I'd like you guys to stand and take a bow. Uh, Missy Price and Nicole Bolter, Polo DeCano, and Jan Bala. Yes, give them. <laughs> oh, yeah, you could do all, go for a pop-up if you want. Okay. <laughs> in fact, we've gone to 13 cities in 10 states, so that shows you the labor intensivity. So like I mentioned, I'd like to give you some sound bites um, just to show you um, sort of the systematic nature of our research and what we found. So in year one, we started with, we had their curriculum, we had their coach training pro program, but there, there were no baseline data. So in year one, we did focus groups and individual interviews because those were going to be the best methods to answer the questions of, you know, how is the program having an impact or is it having an impact and why? Um, we had 95 youth participants in that first year, ranging in age from 11 to 17, and the criterion was that they had at least one year in the program. Um, we also interviewed 26 coaches who had, uh, were regular deliverers of the life skills program, and we had 24 parents who were a subset of parents of the 95 kids. So we got perspectives from the parents, coaches, and the kids to kind of converge the evidence. Uh, six chapters across the United States that varied in geographical region, urban rural status, and uh, diversity. Now, here's an example. I'm just going to give you one example. We uh, developed an interview guide based on qualitative methodology. And we asked all the kids the same questions. This is one for self-management skills based on their uh, curriculum. What have you learned in the first T about managing your emotions on the golf course? And so it's kind of like a, a recall test in a way in terms of if they can come up with the concepts that they were taught. And of course, in terms of positive youth development, we're really interested in the transfer of learning skills within one context to other contexts such as home, school, out of school time activities, et cetera. So we asked, in what other situations do you use strategies to control your emotions? And we asked parallel questions to parents and coaches. So something like, uh, what has your child learned in the first T about managing uh, negative emotions uh, in various situations? So what we did is we used uh, a certain type of analysis called inductive content analysis where we tried to derive the themes of the responses that kids gave. And the ones that's highlighted in blue here are ones that are compatible with the life skills curriculum. So they're taught little tricks or kinds of, uh, you know, memory strategies like STAR stands for stop, think, anticipate the consequences, and then respond. And you can see how that would be very compatible in the golf environment, but also like at home before you go off on your little brother or something like that. Um, another one is be patient, be positive, and if those don't work, then ask for help. 
And then finally, the four R's is, goes like this, replay, relax, ready, redo. That one is, is not as remembered as well. In fact, I had to rehearse that to remember that here today. So um, those were the key recall factors then from the curriculum. And what we did is we found that, so the kids in these different life skill levels, um, the large majority of them were very capable of recalling these main concepts of managing emotions. Now I mentioned that what's important is the transfer to other domains and so in that second question, kids were able to give us examples of, of how they use STAR and be patient, be positive and ask for help at school with teachers and classmates, at home with parents and siblings was a, a very um, prominent example, others my age, in sports and even in public places. And when we evaluated the percentage, um, it was unanimous. All 95 kids were able to give us pretty compelling evidence of being able to transfer these types of life skills they learned within a golf or physical activity context to other areas of their life. Now, as many of you know, um, in qualitative methodology, one of the neatest things that comes out of that type of research are the quotations from the interviewees um, mouths themselves and in interviewing 11 to 17 year olds this was a very fun part for all of us as researchers. So I'm just going to give you one example of um, a 14 year old boy who talked about using star uh, when he goes out to eat and he says here when I go to McDonald's, many times I don't get what I ordered, like they don't put the right sauce on it or they put onions. <laughs> Instead of like getting mad, I just have to relax and then just go tell them calmly if they can do it again. Because if I came and I was angry at them, they'd be reluctant to do what I asked. They might just mess up again just to get back. That was one of the more creative responses um, in terms of using STAR and he was very excited to tell us about that experience. So that is just a sound bite um, in terms of the self-management skills. We did this for all of the other skills as well in their curriculum. And by and large, we found that the children, the adolescents were very good at recalling the concepts and providing examples of transfer. So as a summary in year one, uh, we found that the narrative provided not only by the youth, uh, but by their parents and their coaches converged on life skills learning and transfer. Some were better than others. Uh, the meeting and greeting and self-management goal setting, the recall was a little bit less, but by and large very successful. The percentage of youth showing life skills knowledge and transfer provides some initial evidence of effectiveness of the program. And then um, that the findings provide what I would call initial data that the first T is having a positive impact. And I say initial because we know that what really is sort of uh, the test of time is whether these kids can retain or remember these life skills as they get older, as they mature, and they're able to use it in uh, developmentally appropriate contexts as they get older. So having said that, we launched into year two with two major purposes. Um, how well um, can kids retain their life skills learning and their ability to transfer life skills learned in the golf context to other domains? And we did this um, uh, in year two primarily with, again, interviews, because that's what we used in year one. But Importantly, as a result of the interview responses in year one, we were able to develop and validate a quantitative measure of life skills transfer, which allowed us um, to compare participants in the first T with youth and other organized activities that didn't have this life skills curriculum on life skills transfer, general life skills, and also developmental outcomes or those nine core values. So our participants in the year that didn't have this life skills curriculum on life skills transfer, general life skills, and also developmental outcomes or those nine core values. So our participants in year two, we were able to secure 533 kids um, ages 10 to 18 in the first T, 
Um, and then the comparison group, the kids came, 75% um, came from team and individual sports from other organizations. Uh, we also had kids in music and bands, some youth organizations, some in physical education. And you can see that the age was very similar, uh, more males than females. Uh, we had a pretty diverse sample in terms of race and ethnicity. And then years in the program, I want to point this out because this will come up a little bit later. I was a little worried. Uh, the average number of years in the program for the first T kids was 2.4, and the average number of years uh, of the kids in the other programs was a whole year more. So I was a little worried at first about some of that differences, but that will come back um, to show some strength. Um, we interviewed 20 of the 95 returning youth from year one. These were kids that varied in gender, age, race, ethnicity, um, and geographical region. They averaged about 16 years of age. And we coded the interviews for, for several things. Uh, evidence of retention by being able to give us compelling examples, and we were pretty rigorous with that. 18 of the 20 or 90 percent um, were able to convince us that they uh, remembered the life skills concepts and did in fact transfer them to other domains. Uh, we looked at the, the domains in which they used um, the skills. Themes refer to the things like STAR and 4Rs and Goal Ladder and looking at the compelling quotes. So I'd like to kind of combine the quotes with the domains and themes by sharing a couple of quotations with you. Actually, across all three years, 100% um, of the kids talk about transferring the life skills learned in the golf context to situations at school. And so in this example, I have a 16-year-old boy who used STAR to deal with some tough, um, tough issues at school. So he says, one of the biggest things with STAR is to not get down on yourself but to stop, think, anticipate, respond, which helps you not make the same mistake twice. Say I get a poor grade on a test. By using STAR, I can stay positive because I realize that it's one grade, and if I work hard and I get some other good grades, it can sort of cancel out and it's not the end of the world. So it's very much a positive approach to if you got a bad grade, he's kind of using this positive approach um, to respond and do better. Another area in which kids uh, talked about um, using uh, the skills learned in the golf context is out of school activities. In this example, a 16-year-old boy is very specific about how he uses goal-setting concepts with his band members. One of our first goals was learn how to play as a band. Then things like get shows, write songs, get recordings out. The first T teaches that you can't take some big goal. It has to be important to you. It has to be reachable. It can't be a dream because that's not fully in your control. So you have to set goals step by step, taking it one at a time, little goals that are definitely reachable. So you can see from these two quotes um, how um, in, in these two examples that they use different themes, one being kind of the goal setting concepts and the other star, to transfer it to school and then dealing with their friends in an out of school time activity. Now you might recall the second purpose in year two was to compare uh, the first T participants with kids and other organized activities on life skills and outcomes. And um, as I mentioned, we developed a and validated a measure of life skills transfer. So let me orient you. Um, let's see. Well, I'll, I'll just kind of talk you through it. But down the vertical side uh, are the scores on this life skills transfer survey method. And they range from one to five. And down the, um, the horizontal axis, we have uh, some of the different life skills, meeting and greeting, managing emotions, goal setting, and resolving conflicts. The scores for the first T participants are in blue, and for the kids in the other activities are in yellow. So what you can see by the stars is the first T participants compared favorably to kids in other activities on meeting and greeting skills, managing emotions, and resolving conflicts. Um, they were higher on goal setting, but um, obviously that's not a significant difference, which actually made some sense because since most of the other kids came from some other individual and team sports, goal settings emphasized a lot there as well. 
If we look at other life skills in terms of transfer, making healthy choices, um, that was a non-significant difference, which is probably understandable given the McDonald's quote that I had earlier. Um, <laughs> but that's something that we've, we've kind of given feedback on in terms of improvement in the future. Appreciating diversity, the first T was favorable compared to the other kids. They were higher in helping others, that wasn't significant, but getting help from others or seeking out a go-to team, which is how it's taught in this curriculum, um, also looked favorable. And these effect sizes or the practical significance of this uh, was quite, was in the moderate range. So these were um, strong findings. If we look at some of the outcomes, in terms of confidence, we looked at kids in terms of their perceived academic competence or how well they thought they were doing in school and social acceptance or how well they were dealing with their friends. And you can see that kids in the first tee compared favorably on their perceptions of doing well in school um, and no differences with the social acceptance. If we look at character, kids in the first tee compared favorably to kids in other activities on responsibility, honesty and integrity, higher in respect, not significantly different. That didn't surprise me because the concepts of showing respect um, are taught in many different contexts, so that kind of made some sense. So again, this is a sound bite in terms of looking at the comparisons. Um, and we look at judgment. This is kind of interesting, self-efficacy to resist peer pressure. Uh, kids in the first tee compared favorably. And then also self-efficacy to regulate learning or to be able to regulate, manage their time and manage their learning also came out favorable. If we summarize year two, um, from the interview data, the domains and themes for using life skills were retained over time. I just gave you a couple of examples there. Um, and stories by the participants really provide some vivid examples. I really enjoy um, that quite a bit. And finally, from the quantitative perspective, life skills transfer and developmental outcomes compared favorably to kids in other activities. Now recall, earlier I said, the kids in the first T averaged 2.4 years in the program, kids in the other activities 3.4, and the kids in the first T compared favorably to kids in other activities on the majority of outcomes in life skills transfer. To me, that actually strengthens um, the impact of the first T, given that the kids averaged one less year in the program. Okay, if we move on to year three then, um, again, I'm, I know I'm going a little quickly, but just to give you a sound bite, is we had three purposes here, and the first one was one that actually my students and I were very interested in, and that is determining participation retention rates. It's not actually stated explicitly as a goal in the first T, but given that we're all interested in physically active lifestyles and kids retaining their involvement in physical activity, we were interested in seeing, well, how effective is the first T in getting kids to come back year after year? And then similar to year two is being able to look at how well did the kids um, retain their knowledge and transfer of life skills over time, this time over three years, um, as well as um, using multiple methods, the interviews and the quantitative ratings. So from year two to year three, these are kids, all kids in the first T. Recall we had 533 kids in year two. Um, last year we were able to reassess 303 for a 57% study retention rate, which is really good when you consider longitudinal research and the fact we were traveling around the country. Um, you can see the age range, they're now a year older, obviously almost 14, average 14 years, um, still a diverse sample, averaged almost four years in the program. So these are committed participants that we're getting information from. Let me start with the participation retention. Uh, we were able to gather information on 531 of the 533 kids uh, due, to the, due, to the, due, to the, ah, due to the efforts of my students in calling, emailing, um, talking to chapter directors, um, et cetera. And what we found is that of those 531 that we had data on, over 72% are still in the program. So almost three of every four kids are coming back. This is a really good retention rate, and this, this is a positive, um, positive outcome. 
Of the kids no longer in the program, over half of them still play golf, even though they're not in the first tee. And, and actually, one of the goals of the First Tee program is to grow the game of golf. Uh, Diane mentioned earlier that golf can be a very uh, important context in and of itself. We had one girl who told us she wanted to grow up and be a businesswoman, and she saw golf as an important context for networking with clients. So kids are still playing golf. Importantly, 73% of the sample are playing other sports. Um, whether it's team or individual sports. So three of every four kids are physically active in some way. And that, to me, is a very important finding. And in fact, youth remain physically active, a sign of healthy development. I can't say that it's totally due to the first tee, because we didn't get these kids you know, right when they entered to know what they were. But they're doing something right in having kids coming back year after year. And we, you know, we know that kids are staying physically active. Now, one of the other things we did that was, uh, I thought, very interesting, um, uh, we study a lot about kids' motivation, why they participate, why they drop out. And of course, in year three, we were able to categorize kids as active in the program or inactive in the program. The year before, in year two, we had collected data from the kids on factors that should predict motivation or participation motivation, including enjoyment, um, coach support, best friend support, parent support, perceived competence in golf, and also involvement alternatives, which is how appealing are other activities in comparison to the first tee. And this is what we found. We found four of those variables distinguished the active participants from the inactive participants. On the far left is enjoyment. So this reinforces what my colleagues have said. And remember what Diane said. Enjoyment isn't just like going to get pizza after the game. It's the enjoyment of mastering the skills, of being there with your friends, of the positive relationships with your coaches and mentors. So kids that were active had reported greater enjoyment the year before. Perceived competence in golf. Uh, perceived competence or your confidence in your abilities. Um, if you're not confident about that, that might lead you to try some other activities. So kids um, had higher perceived competence who were active. Um, coach support. The kids who were active in year three had reported greater support from their coaches the year before. And kids who were active reported that other activities were less appealing than staying in the first tee. Now, if you look at especially the first three, enjoyment, perceived competence, and coach support, these are three essential ingredients of creating and maintaining a mastery motivational climate in terms of the coaches being there to teach skills, to make it fun, um, to help them improve skills and get better and, and feel good about themselves. So I feel like these findings were really important in sort of um, pinpointing what are the factors that are keeping kids in and in sharing this with the, um, with the policymakers and the practitioners at the first tee, um, this provides some practical strategies. Now, purpose two, as you recall, was looking at uh, retention of life skills, knowledge, and transfer using our interviews. Of the 20 kids that we had in year two, we were able to access 18 of those um, in year three. You can see now that they averaged about 16 and a half years of age, and they had been in the program for almost six years, so very committed. Again, we looked at evidence of retention. We felt that 16 of the 18 provide, provided us with rigorous and compelling evidence that they had retained the knowledge and were transferring it successfully. I want to show you uh, a graph here on the domains over time in which uh, our adolescents have found uh, the transfer of life skills to be useful. And this is, uh, this is almost like a, this is a developmental glimpse. Um, you can see that 100% of the kids at all three time periods see the life skills as very beneficial for their school performance. So this makes a lot of sense. Now the second, the second row, um, interviewing for a job, applying to college, getting prepared for college, um, thinking about a career, you can see an increase over time in the percentage of adolescents who gave us examples of using the life skills for this area from 35 to 55 to 67. This makes great sense from a developmental perspective. The light bulb is going on. Gee, these skill, skills of meeting and greeting and managing my emotions and goal setting can help me in these areas that become more important as I get older. 
The next one is actually out of school time activities and as the kids are getting older in high school and being engaged, you know, uh, engaged more in civic activities, they're using the life skills. Now family, sports and friends are still important. We didn't interpret the lowered percentages saying that these weren't important domains, but as the other domains um, became more important with age, they gave us more examples in those areas. But you can see, for example, family is um, cited the most in year one when the kids were average more like 13 years of age. Now again, within these domains, um, we were looking for quotations that illuminated that they could remember the themes or the various strategies that they learned in the first T. Um, and now that the kids averaged about 16 and a half years of age, a lot of them gave some examples about getting their driver's license and driving. And so uh, this particular, this boy, um, this 15 year old, the no, 16 year old boy talked about kind of uh, managing emotions and using STAR in, uh, in his driving. So he says, people pull out in front of you, you get cut off and you can't get mad. If I was to get mad at every driver who ever cut me off and pulled out in front of me, I'd probably be shot by now. You just got to keep on going. You got to run, you got to run it through your head and your process. What's the consequences of your actions? Um, so this is one that became more developmentally appropriate in year three. Another area the kids talked about was resolving conflicts or dealing with conflicts with their siblings. And uh, particularly like this quotation from this 15 year old girl. She said, when we go on vacation, we have to share a bed with someone and my little sister is the worst person to share a bed with. My other sister and I argue over who has to share with her. We like talked about it. Okay, you'll share with her on Monday and Wednesday and I'll share with her on Thursday, Friday and Saturday. Before I did the first tea, instead of talking to my sister, I, I would just yell at her. Just listening to both sides, they stress that so much like on and off the course. It was a nice quotation to talk about how you engage in conflict resolution rather than just yelling. And then the last quote I'd like to share with you uh, was from one of our older interviewees, an 18 year old boy who um, through his quotation kind of shows the long term impact of participating in the first T. And he says, the first T's taught me how to present myself as a well established person and be able to work together with people. In a situation like a job interview where you go in there and want to give off the best impression you can, look the person in the eye, shake their hand. What you learn when you're eight years old will carry until you're 20 years old looking for that job. It's stuff you'll remember for your lifetime and they're good skills to have. So very much reflective of what he's learned in the first T. Now, purpose number three, as you might recall, was looking at retention through our quantitative ratings. And I'll go quickly through this. I want to set up uh, what I'm going to show you by this first slide. These are the mean scores for the kids on these life skills in year two. Recall again that they averaged four years of experience. So these mean scores are fairly high. If the scores range from one to five, uh, they're all over three. Now what we were looking for um, in, in, or, in, in terms of evidence of retention or we were looking for stability over time, that is the bar should be about the same height, maybe a little bit higher, maybe a little bit lower because we didn't get kids just in year one where we're going to see that steep learning curve. You know, we had them with an average of four years. So we're kind of looking at stability over time. So in light of that, this is what the life skills transfer scores looked at. Uh, when we compare year two and year three, for meeting and greeting it went up a little bit, but I, I would classify this as fairly stable. Managing emotions, goal setting and resolving conflicts are all pretty stable. They come down a little bit, non-significant, uh, but the kids are showing retention of life skills transfer with our survey methods. If we look at confidence, again, we see fairly stable scores across uh, year two to year three, a little bit of an increase there. With character, again, the bars are all relatively the same size. You know, I might mention, so we're, we're getting ready to collect year three of quantitative data this year. So what will be really important is looking at the trends in these bars. You know, will they continue to go down? Will they go back up? 
um, will they keep going up, that type of thing. So we need that kind of trend. This was an in interesting one for me. We have a self-efficacy to resist peer pressure. We see that was actually a significant decrease with the moderate effect size. Um, again, we need that third data point to see whether it keeps going down or comes back up. And what's interesting to me is that, so the kids now are 16 and a half. Um, are they encountering more situations where they're being challenged to resist peer pressure, to engage in substance abuse or other risky behaviors, um, and they're feeling less confident about that. So this is one that I want to keep an eye on. Um, on the other hand, self-efficacy to regulate learning remains fairly stable. So if we summarize year three, we see then that 16 of 18 interviewees, that comes out to 89%, provided us with convincing evidence of retaining knowledge and transfer of life skills. The domains for life skills transfer showed developmental trends that would be consistent with the child psychology literature and shows us that the kids are, are being able to use those life skills and see the importance of them in important areas of their life. Uh, the themes for using life skills were retained, things like STAR, goal ladder, uh, care for conflict resolution. And then the quantitative scores were stable from year two to year three, which gives evidence of retention over time. And again, uh, we're very interested in looking at uh, this year's data. So in conclusion um, of the data we have now for three years, that using mixed methods, uh, qualitative and quantitative over three years, suggests to us, based on the collective data, that the first T is having a positive impact on teaching life skills and, pro and promoting positive youth development. And again, uh, while there are other youth development programs with a physical activity component that are starting to show some evidence, um, I believe this is the only one or the only one I know of that has sort of this longitudinal component. And if the data continue to be this positive over year four and year five over the next two years, then this program's curriculum and their coach training methods and other kinds of things can serve as an exemplar for other youth development programs that want to use uh, physical activity as a context. Thank you very much.